I call my mom and tell her that... You're an adult, correct? Yeah. I'm not calling your mom. Stay there. When it comes to producing content online, it can be easy to get lost in your own hype. Social media is designed for addiction, and if it's your job, you're spending most of your waking hours on it in some capacity. Your work revolves around you, whether that be just your thoughts and feelings or your entire being. So every time you post online, you're inundated with thousands of comments telling you that you're an amazing person and that you've saved someone's life by being there for them in their most dire moments. And your content is one of a kind. People begin to hold you up as an ideal, praising your work and who you are in general. And due to the addicting nature of social media, it's virtually all you see. Every person you interact with online is someone who is praising you in some capacity. And unless you have people around you to keep you in check, it's easy to buy into that hype. You begin to think that you're the funniest person of your generation, that your editing style is one of a kind, and that anyone who does anything remotely similar to you online must be copying you in some aspects. Your ego begins to grow, and suddenly you view yourself as an incredibly influential artist who deserves the finer things in life. But that is rarely, if ever, true. Through social media, we've seen the rise and fall of countless content creators, most of which have fallen victim to their own egos. But in today's case, we will be discussing a man who, in just a matter of months on Twitter, believed that he had become Disney's sworn enemy and took part in the most elaborate and frankly stupid heist in theme park history. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today, we're going to be going over the case of Patrick Spikes, also known as Backdoor Disney, and how this disgruntled Disney World employee started a one-sided war with the park, and still lost. When I initially started this channel, I focused primarily on crimes that happened on or around Disney, as I found those cases to be especially interesting. So I've been waiting on an appropriate time to make this video, and given the heavy subject matter of the majority of our cases, I found this case would work as a sort of palate cleanser. All of my sources will be linked below, and I highly encourage you check them out, as a lot of the reporting done around this crime was done by independent theme park enthusiasts, and they deserve to have their work seen. Specifically, I wanted to give a quick thank you to the Theme Park Tribune, who was able to put the majority of the documentation regarding this case on their website. They also provided me with tips that had not been made public until now, and I cannot be more thankful. With all of that said, if you prefer my other content, I will have a new video for you in a week. Now, let us begin. Walt Disney's initial concept for Epcot emerged during the early 1960s as he was considering plans for the expansion of Disneyland in California. Disney envisioned Epcot as a living, breathing community where people could work, live, and play. It was meant to be a showcase of technological advancements, as well as urban planning and community living. One of the primary goals of Epcot was to address various societal and technological challenges. Disney wanted to create an environment where ideas and innovations could be tested and implemented, demonstrating how technology and community living could improve people's lives. He envisioned Epcot as a platform for corporate and government collaboration, where the companies and organizations could showcase their latest developments. Sadly, Walt Disney passed away in 1966, before he could fully realize his vision for Epcot. Following his death, the Walt Disney Company decided to move forward with the construction of a theme park called Epcot Center, which opened in 1982 at Walt Disney World Resort in Florida. While it retained some elements of Walt's original concept, such as showcasing technological advancements and international cultures, it primarily focused on entertainment and education, rather than being a functioning community. The park was split up into a world showcase, which was dedicated to showing cultures from around the world, and the other half was Future World, which was dedicated to science, technology, and hopeful visions of the future. The Future World side of the park primarily focused on education, with shows and attractions meant to teach lessons and expand the minds of children. When Disney decided to move forward with this concept, they approached several corporate sponsors to help fund certain pavilions in the park. For example, when the Universe of Energy Pavilion opened, it was primarily sponsored by Exxon Mobil. They would fund the majority of the ride, from the construction to the upkeep, and the pavilion would have advertisements within the ride itself. However, this approach would have multiple unforeseen consequences from Disney partnering with less than savory companies like Monsanto, who produced Agent Orange during the Vietnam War, and sponsors deciding to pull out after their contracts had expired. 
When sponsors would pull out, they would leave Disney, shouldering the cost of the ride maintenance and upkeep. Some of these rides were incredibly well made, and the advertisements throughout were subtle and unintrusive. However, others were not. Fitting corporate sponsors into a whimsical ride is a hard task, and some of the rides in the Future World section of the park would be panned because of that. Similarly, Future World wasn't something that a lot of people, especially kids, felt drawn to. They weren't going to Disney World to learn, and when given the choice, they enjoyed the park that was filled with whimsical cartoon characters and rides about them. In 1989, Disney opened the Wonders of Life Pavilion, which was an area of Future World dedicated to health and fitness. The area was sponsored by MetLife and contained two main attractions. One of these attractions was Body Wars, Epcot's first thrill ride that utilized the Atlas simulation technology also used in Star Tours. The second main attraction was Cranium Command, a sit-down audio-animatronic theater show that educated audiences about the importance of the brain and the relationship between the human brain and the body. The star of Cranium Command was Buzzy, an animatronic soldier whose job was to pilot a 12-year-old boy and keep him out of trouble. You, the audience member, would sit and watch as Buzzy tries his best to make sure the boy gets through the day unharmed. And throughout, you would learn about his left brain and right brain and the differences between the two. Video of the show can be found online, and the show served as inspiration for the movie Inside Out. The pavilion was popular when it first opened, as Body Wars was the first ride of its kind in the Florida park. It used the same ride system as Star Tours in California, and people flocked to it initially to get a taste of the ride. But when Florida would eventually get their own version of the Star Wars simulator, Body Wars' popularity quickly plummeted. Body Wars was the big attraction for the Wonders of Life Pavilion, meant to draw people into the area, whereas Cranium Command was the supplementary show, which was meant to entertain those who didn't want to wait in line for Body Wars and get out of the heat. The general park goer wasn't going out of their way to see Cranium Command, but if they were in the area, they would stop by just to take a break. But with Body Wars no longer drawing people out, less and less people were going to see Cranium Command. In 2001, MetLife ended their partnership with Disney, which meant that they were no longer paying for the upkeep of the pavilion. And due to the area's lack of popularity, Disney made the decision to only open the pavilion seasonally. Six years later, the pavilion would quietly close permanently. But despite the closure, the Wonders of Life pavilion would gain new life, this time as a target for urban explorers. Disney would use the building to hold corporate events, and serve as storage for various festivals they would have in the park, so they rarely locked the doors. Signage for the pavilion had similarly been taken down and removed from park maps, but there was nothing stopping an average park goer from wandering over to the pavilion and seeing what had become of the older rides. Because the building was out of the way, and Disney had taken down any signs leading to it, an average Disney Parks guest wouldn't think to look for the pavilion or enter the building, seeing as it was clearly closed. But with the advent of urban exploring online, it became an easy target. People, usually between the ages of 12 and 30, would go to the pavilion with their cameras and shoot as much behind-the-scenes footage as they could. Though the footage wouldn't go viral, the niche of urban exploring videos online would guarantee a few thousand views, making the footage highly profitable. The urban explorers who would go into the former pavilion found that Cranium Command was still completely intact, with Buzzy still perched in his station ready to go. In 2012, an unknown person entered Cranium Command and stole Buzzy's brown fabric gloves. From then on, photos of him from urban explorers showed him with his bare metallic animatronic hands. Authentic Disney theme park memorabilia is incredibly profitable, with people paying thousands of dollars for props used in the parks. As of writing, there is currently a candelabra that was supposedly used in the Haunted Mansion that is on sale on eBay for nearly $4,000. If the prop is authentic, it was likely stolen from the parks, but Disney collectors often do not mind that fact, and are willing to pay top dollar to get a piece of the parks in their home. It's estimated that Buzzy's gloves alone would have been sold for a couple thousand dollars. In early 2018, an urban explorer found that Buzzy, in the hypothalamus, the other animatronic in the show, had been red-tagged, meaning that they were marked to be stored away in the archives. This meant that the pavilion would likely be undergoing some massive changes in the coming years, and more likely that urban exploring in the area would no longer be possible. But before that could happen, a second theft occurred. This time, Buzzy's headphones, hat, and brown bomber jacket were taken from the ride. Documents would note, 
that Disney was made aware of the theft on August 8th, but chose to keep the theft quiet in order to not draw attention to what had happened and alert the potential thieves. In documents, Disney had reportedly hired private investigators to look into the crime, at which point they came across the Twitter account Backdoor Disney. In late 2018, a Twitter account going by the name Backdoor Disney would begin posting. The account would post exclusive, never-before-seen photos of Disney World, showing rides with their lights completely on, backstage areas, and footage of Disney animatronics. The account was said to be run by someone who was or had been working at the parks, and could get footage that the average parkgoer couldn't. Within a few months of posting, the account was able to gain over 8,000 followers, with people actively requesting more content. The person behind the account subsequently made a YouTube channel and began posting more urban exploring content, exploring Epcot's image works and other backstage areas. His content, though impressive, was also incredibly antagonistic towards Disney. After nearly a week of posting, the person behind the account would go on to state that they were a disgruntled former employee of the park, who had been forced to quit after being disillusioned by the corporation. They claimed that they noted multiple issues within the parks themselves, like how security was too lax and how Disney allowed for people like him to get away with being in backstage areas. He also claimed that he had witnessed multiple instances of sexual harassment and employee abuse, stating that the manager had told a character actor not to eat because she would be too bloated to look like a princess. Backdoor Disney reportedly wanted to be a voice for the voiceless and stand up for the men and women who still worked at the park by posting pictures and videos that Disney wouldn't want the public to see. He reportedly stated that Disney would likely try to take him down and to silence him, but he was willing to be the martyr for this cause. Nearly two weeks after beginning his account, Backdoor Disney claimed that his content had already put him in the corporation's line of fire. He tweeted, quote, For the time being, I am halting my backstage posts. I am still taking submissions and will start posting other people's content in the future. I'm going to let Disney security focus on catching the real dangers and worry less about the minor things that are happening like me. Which, to be clear, Backdoor Disney did pose a real and obvious security threat to Disney, as well as a safety threat to park goers. His posts were not innocuous, especially given that he would directly show people how to break into backstage areas in the Disney parks and he actively encouraged others to follow in his footsteps. He would describe the backstage areas that had little to no security, and directly told his followers, which included children, to try and break into restricted areas. He repeatedly stated that if anyone was to follow his instructions and get hurt by going into a place that was clearly labeled restricted by Disney, that it was still Disney's fault, because they made breaking into these areas so easy. If they cared, he said, they would have made it harder for him. He also directly solicited fake name tags and identification for other parks in the area, with the implication that he would use these name tags to get access to backstage areas and other parks. As his Twitter account continued to grow in popularity, his perception of Disney worsened. He openly characterized the corporation as being evil and trying to take his account down unjustly. After a month, he tweeted, quote, I decided to try and please Disney by taking down some of the content in my YouTube videos. Now that they have angered me, my videos have been listed as public. And the posting continues. That same day, he tweeted again, saying, Disney has been contacting me. Obviously, my identity has been compromised. They are wanting information on some other people. At this point, you're not going to find me in the parks. So you guys, just keep chasing your tails. Followed by... Every tweet of mine gets printed out and put in a folder. Keep printing, boys. Just another page in your folder. Maybe instead of watching me, you should be watching your intellectual property that keeps getting stolen by people that are unrelated to me. Thinking emoji. His tweet mentioned property being stolen out of the Disney parks, something that hadn't been publicly reported on at the time. Strangely enough, his post coincided with a lead detective investigating the theft of Disney World property, getting a tip on November 26th, that the animatronic that was in the Cranium Command, Buzzy, was set to be stolen, and that the theft would be an inside job. When the investigator followed up with Disney World security staff, they confirmed that the animatronic had already been stolen, and they hadn't reported it. At that point, they made an official report 
writing, quote, I was working as the Epcot investigator on November 19th, 2018, at approximately 1040, when I was notified by the communications center that an animatronic character was missing from the Wonders Building. The character was reported missing by Ron M. of Walt Disney Imagineering. On my arrival, I was unable to find any electrical switches and a used flashlight to view the area. The figure was on a platform that was approximately seven feet in the air. The electrical connections appeared to be severed and the character was missing. There was considerable fluid in the area that I assume was hydraulic fluid from the character. There was an elevator lift below the platform that had power to it. The area is unsecured and open to anyone in the area, and there was a previous incident that the Orange County Sheriff's Department has investigated involving this character. The character was designated to be taken by Disney Archives, and I left a message with them to contact me to see if they may have taken the character without notification. They have not returned my call. The area is a discontinued part of an attraction called Cranium Command that has been closed for several years. None of that information was publicly known at the time, but it seemed that Backdoor Disney whoever he was, was either a suspect in the case who had been questioned over the theft or new information only the thief would know. It wouldn't be until nearly two weeks later, on December 21st, 2018, when the Twitter account DreamFinderGuy would shockingly report that there had been a theft at the Wonders of Life Pavilion. This report was made after Backdoor Disney himself confirmed that the figure had been stolen from the show and that Disney was looking into him as a possible suspect. People didn't believe the initial tweet as the concept of someone being able to smuggle a 300-pound large animatronic out of the Disney park seemed far-fetched. Multiple Disney enthusiasts looked into it. Theme Park Tribune put in a FOIA request for the information from the Orange County Police Department. Through that request, he was able to get access to the police report regarding the theft of the clothes in his hands, but not the animatronic itself. Multiple theme park-specific press outlets and the theme park enthusiasts felt that this version of events made the most sense. An urban explorer had likely gone into the wonders of life, taken Buzzy's clothes to sell, and the initial report had been a simple miscommunication. However, soon after the report was made, another urban explorer would go into the pavilion with the express purpose of seeing if the animatronic boy was there, only to find he was missing, and his lines had been cut in a haphazard way. The removal looked unprofessional and dangerous, and people began to believe that Buzzy had been stolen out from under Disney. By Backdoor Disney's posts, it seemed that he was aware of the theft at least two weeks earlier than the public, and had been interrogated by police over the theft, but had somehow proven his innocence. It also seemed that he felt like their suspicion of him was unwarranted, and that they were trying to take him down unfairly due to his social media posts. He would go on to tweet that he was not going to back down to the corporation, that he stood on the side of truth, and that, comically, he was going to fight for his Twitter account until he dies. Despite Backdoor Disney's attempt to disguise his voice in interviews and making sure his image wasn't seen in any of his videos or pictures, Disney was able to immediately identify him. Disney security investigators told the police that the man behind the account was an employee named Patrick Spikes and that he had been taking pictures and videos of backstage areas while at work. The following is an excerpt from his arrest warrant. During the internal investigation, Disney had discovered that Spikes was developing an online social media presence to display these pictures. Spikes created a Twitter account of Backdoor Disney, where he would post backstage photos. A photo posted October 14th, 2018, shows the animatronic Buzzy with clothes still attached. Disney advised Spikes had photographs of other animatronics that were reported stolen last year on his phone. Detective Jesse Hinson and I spoke to Spikes in late November to determine if he had any information on the location of the stolen items. We had also recently learned that the entire Buzzy animatronic was later stolen from the attraction, separately from the clothing. Spikes denied any first-hand knowledge of these thefts, but provided vague information of people we could look into, but would not provide last names or specifics. Spikes stated he would contact us if he heard anything. According to Spikes' tweets, Disney did this in order to shake him down and to get him to close his account. But, given that he had legitimately posted proof that he had been the last person to enter the Wonders of Life pavilion before Buzzy was stolen, it made sense as to why he was questioned. On November 19th, 2018, the detective in charge of the case was made aware that Spikes had sent pictures to another Disney World employee showing that he had Buzzy's stolen clothing in his possession. This picture also showed a tan backpack, which Spikes had been seen wearing on a number of occasions in the park. 
the police had the informant text Spikes about the clothing and ask if he had stolen it. Patrick denied that he had stolen the clothing, despite having it, then claimed that the items had been sold for $8,000 by someone else. The next day, Patrick was asked to come into the police station for another interview. This footage was posted by Theme Park Tribune. And I will, let me get my folder and stuff. Any water or anything? I'm good. Alright, give me a second. Immediately after the officer leaves the room, Patrick waves at the security camera in the corner. As seen through his various tweets on the Backdoor Disney account, Patrick seems to believe that he is the main character of a heist movie and an extremely important person overall. He believes that he is being brought in by Disney themselves, that higher-ups at Disney are watching him, just sitting and stewing in the interrogation room, and they're trying to figure out how to pin this caper on him. This is his second interview, the first of which I have attempted to get access to, and given that he's been brought in a second time, you would think he would be a little worried, questioning if they had found anything, had they connected him to the thief, or if he should have brought a lawyer with him, but at least in this moment, he is smug and comfortable. The movement is subtle, but as he sits in the interview room, he just took a picture and is currently tweeting on the Backdoor Disney account. Again, Patrick focuses on the camera, and does so in an antagonistic way. He squares his shoulders and makes unblinking eye contact, the way a movie villain would when trying to gain dominance over another party. It's clear that he views himself as being incredibly important and smart, like some sort of anime villain. In his mind, he holds all of the cards in this situation, and he doesn't have to be accountable to the police. So, 
I know you're worried about on the phone, like getting trespassed and all that. I'm not doing it. No one from Disney's here. The detective immediately assures Patrick that no one from Disney is there in the police station to view his interview, which is something Patrick had previously been worried about. Based on his tweets, Patrick viewed himself as a kind of threat to Disney. He, a lone person with a Twitter account under 10,000 followers, was the corporation's biggest threat. For this to be the first thing a detective states when starting an interview, Patrick had to have expressed incredible concern over the idea that Disney higher-ups would be in the police station trying to get him on the grounds of trespassing, which, to be clear, they were well in the right to do. He had trespassed on private property and broken into various attractions and uploaded proof of his crimes onto YouTube. They could have pressed charges on him at any time. Um, you asked me something else. Oh, well, you're not detained, you're not arrested, you're free to leave. You understand that? Yeah. Okay, I want to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, yeah, Kent coming in in a minute. Have you heard anything new? Since we last spoke. According to the case summary, when Spikes had initially been interviewed, they repeatedly stated that they didn't believe he was a suspect. Rather, they brought him in on the off chance that he knew something due to his close ties to the urban exploring community. He gave them vague information, including the names of other urban explorers, but maintained he knew nothing about what had occurred. By them opening with this question, asking if he knows anything else, they are putting the ball in his court. Being asked to come into a police station is stressful, especially if you believe you are a suspect in a grand theft case. The police aren't going to repeatedly interview you unless they have new information that affects what you have already told them. And in this case, that could really only mean that they have found evidence that points directly to Spikes. But by asking if he has any new information, they are assuring him, for the time being, that the evidence isn't pointing his way. By opening up their line of questioning like this, Spikes can be in control of what they know, where they look, and what occurs in this case. I mean, a few people who I know who might would have. Okay. This is Kent III. Okay. Anybody who I think would might have heard anything, who collects things or whatever. I mean, no one even no one even believed me that he actually was like gone. Really? Yeah. Okay. People were telling me you guys were lying to me, and I was like. So. No, no, you, no idea where he went. No idea. Wish I could help. The officer is showing Spikes a picture of the hydraulic cable, which was hacked through. Okay. And you zoom in. I want to see like the cable. It's literally just. God damn. Yeah. So imagine you would not do that. Literally just cut. Yeah. According to a video that Patrick would later put out, along with theories he would later publish via Twitter, he would go on to state that either Disney Imagineering or the people working at Disney Archives had been behind the animatronic's removal. However, how the animatronic was removed is incredibly important. As noted, the hydraulic line had been cut, which caused hydraulic fluid to spray all over the platform Buzzy had been placed on. Other electrical lines had also been cut, which was incredibly dangerous. Disney would have the time, means, and ability to remove the animatronic safely, and has protocols in place to ensure that no one is harmed in the process. So why would they forego that and endanger their own workers? The short answer is, they wouldn't. Hold on, zoom out a little bit. Hold on. Can you zoom out? Yeah. yeah. That's that's crazy. Yeah. So it's really gone. Because you know, I mean, you work there. You you know that they wouldn't remove it like that. No. So what kind of tools does it take to do that? That's a big bundle of cable, or you just cut through each one. I don't know what kind of wire that is. Is it like hydraulic cables? Yeah, well, there was a bunch of hydraulic fluid on the ground, so some of it was, but I think it's, uh, there's electrical also. I don't know. I'm assuming... Well... I don't know. I have seen them cut cables like that before, but usually the hydraulic fluid is, is draining on the ground. Oh, no, this was, like, all over the auditorium. Like, like yeah. it was still under pressure. So that's how we know it wasn't... Well, plus Disney doesn't have it. You know, they would know if they removed it. And yeah, they, yeah, obviously. Um... Like I said, no one even like I, people are like people. I, I, left, I left I left last time. People were like I was like telling like my friends. I'm like, God, this thing got, got stolen, and like like I'm. I had someone tell me like, No, he didn't. No, no, he didn't. That thing's still sitting in there. Like actually, I was trying to convince someone like to go in there and look, but like 
They're like, why? I'm like, I'll take a guy stolen. They're like, I'm not going in there. Patrick is an idiot. Again, his main concern walking into this interview was that Disney was going to charge him with trespassing. And within 10 minutes, he openly admitted to the police that he tried to convince another party to trespass on a crime scene. Yeah, I probably can now. Yeah. They're all over that place. They were not. And in 2019, after this interview, Patrick would go back to the Wonders of Life Pavilion to film another video, showcasing how Buzzy was gone, because he couldn't help himself. I wouldn't fit yourself. Okay. So, you don't know where he is? You don't know where his clothes are? Mm-hmm. Okay. Alright. <clears throat> do you have a cell phone? I do. What kind of phone do you have? iPhone. iPhone. Um, your phone ever been stolen, for example? No. Why are you okay. ask? Well, I'm trying to figure out if anyone would have taken your phone and used it anywhere. Why do you think this? I'm asking. Okay. So you don't loan your phone out to anybody else. Okay. So, because here's why. <clears throat> so we're going to talk. <clears throat> All right. The day prior, Spikes had sent those pictures of Buzzy's stolen clothes to a co-worker from his phone, which he just confirmed is in his possession and had never been stolen, and only he has access to it. He is now well and truly aware of how screwed he is. Let's watch him react. So you want to maybe... Let's clear this up now. What about it? What do you mean, what about it? What is that? It's like a jacket. It, it's giant words. What jacket is that? Cranium Command. Okay. Can you put your phone on the table for me? Yeah, just put it over here. Don't mess with it. Just put it down. Okay. So, are these pictures on that phone? Nope. They were. Were they taken with that phone? Nope. They were. Okay. So how long have you owned that phone? Maybe... I mean... No, put it down. I don't want you t- touching it. So how long have you had that phone? In that particular one, maybe two months. Mm-hmm. The other one got broken. The other one got broken. Were these taken with the broken phone? Nope. Okay. That's your car. Is it really, though? Yeah. Patrick doesn't say, no, it's not. He also doesn't have a firm rebuttal and doesn't react to the statement with any outright refusal. If anything, that's just a smarmy response that you would usually see a middle schooler give when they don't want to take accountability for their actions. How do you know? A lot of BMWs out there. Okay. So those pictures are on the internet right now, and they're attached to your phone number. You didn't send those pictures out? Nope. Okay. When did you get that phone? I guess probably like two months ago. You're guessing or you know? I mean, I can probably go back on my Verizon account and figure it out. What's your phone number? 407. Mm-hmm. 839. Nine five seven eight. Where's your old phone? At my house somewhere. It's broken. What kind of phone was that? I think it was like an iPhone seven eight. What color was it? Red. Screen's like destroyed. And, and you didn't fix the screen, you just got a whole new phone? Nope. You got a whole new phone? Yep. Okay. So that's not your car. You don't own a bag like that or ever possessed one like that. This isn't Disney World backstage. This isn't your leg. I just want to get this all out in the open so later on, because obviously you, you realize now I know more than you think I know. Okay? I want to make sure all your lies are straight right now or you want to come forward right now, because I know a little bit more than I'm telling you, Patrick. What do you know? Patrick sincerely believes that he is a movie villain. He's being shown definitive proof that he has stolen clothes out of the Cranium Command, and that that can be linked back to him. And when told the officers know more than he thinks they do, instead of amending his story to fit the evidence or trying to justify his answers, he simply responds, what do you know? I just told you, I'm not telling you. This is your car, that's your leg, these are the things you had in your possession, we want them back. If you're going to sit here and tell me this isn't your car, I know that's your car. 
like a BMW to me. It is, but it's your car. It's unique features on it. What's unique about this? I'm not answering your questions. Okay? This is your car. Well, how about this? Yep. I'm about to walk out. Okay. And you guys want to talk and come back to my attorney. How about that? Okay. Keep the car there. And we're keeping your phone. And actually, no, give me that. Before starting the interview, the officers had gotten a search warrant for Patrick's phone due to the photos he had sent to a co-worker. Though they didn't take the phone during the interview, the moment that they showed him the evidence against him, they could no longer allow him to take the phone back, as he would likely go on and delete the evidence on it. Immediately after being told they're keeping the phone, he goes back to grab it, for some reason thinking they were just going to let him walk out afterwards. Damn it. Okay. I'm under arrest. Okay, I'm going to cooperate. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, you're going to be secured right now. Okay, you're not going to destroy evidence right in front of me. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to destroy evidence. Okay. You can let me up. I'm not no, we're not letting you up. up. We're going to get some handcuffs and we're going to secure you right now. Am I, am I under arrest? You're going to be detained at this point. They're online. We're done speaking to you because now you're detained. On you? Any knives? No. My car. car keys. Can't search that without a warrant, buddy. Even when being detained, he cannot drop the act. Neither officer was going to search his car, but when his keys are removed, he remarks that they need a warrant to search. So, when can I get my attorney? No one's speaking to you, because we can't speak to you without one. So have a seat. Relax. Can I make a phone call? No, you are being detained. Am I under arrest, though? So I believe, I don't think you can keep me if I'm not under arrest. I'm not under arrest. For Am I under arrest? This is all of the footage that was uploaded by Theme Park Tribune, which again will be linked below, but the following is an excerpt from the arrest affidavit. Spikes was detained pending additional search warrants to his residence as well as the phone. The defendant stated he felt sick and felt like he was going to vomit. A short time later, he began to make strained breathing noises and stated that he couldn't breathe. He requested water, which was given to him, and was allowed to lay on the floor. The fire department responded and all vitals were normal. The defendant was transported to Dr. Phillips Hospital by Reedy Creek Fire Department, then to BRC by patrol. 
Following his interview, a search warrant was obtained for Spike's residence, and the tan backpack in the photos was found. But notably, none of the items that had been pictured were inside of the residence. Patrick was subsequently charged with resisting an officer without violence and eventually let go. These charges were later dropped. Patrick's cell phone provided a treasure trove of evidence against him. He had pictures of multiple stolen items that had been placed throughout his home, including other animatronic outfits, wigs, and props, but none of these items had been found when the house was searched. It was through their search of the phone that more items from Disney were found to be stolen. One photo showed a close-up of a costume tag that read, AA Magic Kingdom Haunted Mansion Figure 32A. A Disney investigator saw the photograph and found that the dress was reported as stolen from a locker inside the haunted mansion. It had avoided being reported stolen earlier, as it was one of two outfits that rotated out for cleaning. In other photos, Patrick had dressed up in some of the items, proving beyond a doubt that he had taken part in the heist. But Patrick wasn't alone. Sometime after being hired by Disney, Patrick had made a fake employee ID tag for his cousin, Blayton Taunton. The ID used the name Jack D. Marrow, and together they would use the Disney World Utilidors to traverse the park, stealing various items and taking videos for Backdoor Disney. The following is an excerpt from Patrick's arrest warrant. On July 31, 2018, at 1521 hours, a photograph is taken of a Disney employee ID card being made inside of a printing machine. Later close-ups of the ID show the employee picture looks similar to Blayton Taunton, Spike's cousin, and suspect in additional related cases. The name on the ID is Jack D. Marrow. Disney confirms there is no such employee at their part, and the number on the ID card, 00712592, belongs to an employee who no longer works for the company. At 2.052 hours, Spikes uses his employee ID card to enter the Contemporary Resort employee parking gate. This lot is adjacent to the Magic Kingdom guest entrance, and is believed that Spikes stopped here briefly to drop off Taunton so he could enter the guest entrance. At 2.059 hours, Blade and Taunton used his Disney ticket to enter the Magic Kingdom park through the guest entrance. At 2.105 hours, Patrick Spikes used his employee ID card to enter the Magic Kingdom using the Westlock employee entrance. At 21.24 hours, Spikes and Taunton took a photo together in the Utilidor area of the Magic Kingdom. These areas are underground tunnels for employees only. The tunnels allow access to different areas of the park, both guest and backstage areas. In this photo, Spikes is wearing a button-down, collared blue and white striped dress shirt with a Disney name tag. Taunton is wearing a black polo shirt by Disney stage crew personnel and a Disney name tag that says, Jose. Taunton is not an employee of Walt Disney World. Taunton is also wearing a backpack that was later revealed while executing a search warrant of Spike's home in the related case. In that case, the backpack was used to conceal stolen animatronic costuming. At 2200 and 2201 hours, photographs were taken of animatronics in the Haunted Mansion attraction of the Magic Kingdom. This area is not accessible to the public. Embedded GPS information in the photographs confirmed the photos were taken at the Haunted Mansion. Disney attraction records show that the attraction was open and occupied at this time, not only by employees, but by over 1,000 guests per hour, from the hours of 2100 to 2300. Disney records also show that Spikes was not scheduled to work that day and was not being paid for working that day. It would not be permitted inside the attraction since that is not his job assignment, even if he was working. Though the police had not been able to find Buzzy, they had found a bevy of evidence showing that Patrick and his cousin had stolen thousands of dollars worth of Disney World props, including Buzzy's clothes, and with that information, began to develop an incredibly strong case against the urban explorer. They talked to multiple Disney collectors who had met up and bought items from Patrick. They also traced payments from PayPal to his checking account and interviewed multiple co-workers to see if they had any further information. But because the police didn't immediately charge him for theft, Patrick believed he was in the clear, despite not having the foresight to delete any of the evidence off of his phone. In the police, showing him that they had direct evidence of him taking the stolen items, Patrick believed that he had been able to best Disney in the Orange County Police, and that they had waited too long to charge him with a crime. His posting on Backdoor Disney became even more antagonistic, with him posting a video on March 23rd, going back into the Cranium Command and showing how Buzzy had been stolen. He similarly posts tweets goading Disney for having holes in some of their fencing, 
holes that he had used to break into the park prior. Then, on March 19th, 2019, he posted a video titled, Disney Raided My House Searching for Stolen Animatronics. So far, this is the only time a person we have covered has made their own YouTube video going over the case details, and as such, we will go over it. I really wish the title of this video was a big lie, but unfortunately it's not. Let's talk about it. <laughs> so, there's been a lot of talk about Buzzy recently. Um, was he stolen? Was he removed? Who stole him? Who removed him? Um, but to find out, we gotta go all the way back to where it started. Where the rumors started, anyways. So, my name is Patrick, and I'm the one who created Backdoor Disney. In November, I was accused by Disney and Orange County uh, Sheriff's Office of stealing an animatronic named Buzzy that was worth $120,000. This is not true. Patrick was only ever accused of having the stolen items, that being Buzzy's clothes, in his possession. He was never accused directly of stealing Buzzy, although he was widely suspected. It's also clear that he is hand-waving any and all evidence against him, even the pictures of him holding the stolen items in his car. These were photos found on his phone and sent to others. How he can deny that as direct evidence, I do not know. Well, that's kind of a big accusation if you ask me. So just a little history before I start the story. Um, Buzzy was an animatronic from a show called Cranium Command. Well, Cranium Command opened in 1989 and ran through 2007. Well, in 2007, the show closed and the entire thing just stayed abandoned. Uh, they didn't gut anything, they left everything sitting how it was. Um, well, the entire area became like a urban explorer's like paradise, you know, there's animatronics in there, there's all kinds of cool stuff. And there have been tons of people going in and taking video and pictures. You know, it was almost common knowledge that there was abandoned stuff back there and it had been visited by many, many people. So, late November, I believe November 27th actually, or 28th, I get a phone call and it's from Disney. And at this point, I already had separated myself from the company. I no longer work for them. Um, and it's somebody saying, hey man, like, you gotta second the talk. I said, yeah, what's up? Um, they said, well, something went missing, and we know you've been inside of the area where it went missing from. And I said, okay. They said, we know you're back door Disney. I said, okay, fair enough. That's not hard to figure out. Um, well, it was Buzzy, the animatronic. The entire thing got cut like off this base and, uh, and got stolen. I said, wow, like, Really? The entire thing got stolen? Like, I didn't really believe it. Um, so, went on and they name dropped some people, you know. Hey, Joe Blow, you know, do you know Joe Blow? And I'm like, uh, no, I don't know. I don't know who that is. Why? And they're like, oh, we, we think he has something to do with it. And I'm like, uh, well, I don't know who it is. They said, what about Jim? You know Jim? I said, mm, don't know Jim. Jim who? And they're like, well, we don't know Jim's last name. And I'm like, well, sorry, I don't know who it is. I uh, can't help you. Um, they said, okay, whatever. End of the phone call. Uh, like an hour later, I get another call. And I picked up, and it's uh, some detective from Orange County. And the guy said, hey there, what's going on? You know, he was nice. Uh, asked me a few basic questions. They said, well, we, we know you had something to do with Buzzy. If you didn't steal him yourself, you know who did. And it wouldn't surprise us if you got a cut of the money. We know you're involved. They accused me and literally said I got a cut of the money from the heist. I was like, really? Like, this isn't fake? This isn't a prank? Like, it blew my mind. I was like, right, you can't be serious right now. The actual animatronic gets stolen. Well, I didn't like being accused very much, so I said, no, nah, no, thank you. Be with it yourself. It wasn't me. Bye. Um, well, the guy continued to call me, like, every other day for, like, almost a month. And I was just like, okay, whatever. And he'd leave me a voicemail and say, like, hey, man, we can't, we can't uh, finish this case without you, you know? Like, um, we need you to, to help us figure out who this is. We know you know people, um, whatever. You know, we just want to think, we want it back. And when we get it back, if you help us, you can, uh, you can take a picture with it, you know? Like... Uh, the guy is like, oh, we like what you're doing, like, we watched your videos, they're kind of funny, you know, we don't, we're not against you for the whole backstage thing, you know, 
that's not that's not our problem. That's Disney's problem to deal with. So you know, just help us out. And I was like, mm, no, nah, no, thank you. Still, it's important to Patrick that he frames his narrative in the most self-congratulatory way possible. Even when he is being questioned by the police over a serious crime, he characterizes the police as being extremely complimentary of him. Sure. They believe he stole a piece of technology valued at over $300,000, but they also think he's funny and cool, and they love his Twitter account. Um, well, December 19th, you know, knock on my door at like 8 a.m. Well, it's this guy. And he pulled out a case file, and he had pictures of inside Cranium Command uh, showing all the hydraulic lines that were just sliced. And amongst that bundle, uh, which you can find pictures of online, and I think I'm actually posted one, or gonna post one, can't remember. But um, amongst that is also like electrical lines in there too, because he had lights on them. We know every aspect of what he just said is false. A police officer didn't show up at his door. He willingly came down to the station. The photos of the hydraulic line were on the officer's phone, not in a case file. These details are subtle and might seem unimportant, but when someone is recalling a story and they lie about small things like this, it's usually in service of a larger lie. And I said, well, it, it had to have been an inside job. You know, you can't just cut through electrical lines. Are you crazy? You know, that's how you die. Obviously, that is not what he said. The officer was direct that this was not done by Disney, and he agreed, only stating that he has seen Disney do something similar in the past, which is not true, as when he worked in the park, he worked in attractions. More specifically, he helped people get on and off the Astro Orbiter. So he keeps on showing me, like, stuff, uh, like evidence, you know, like pictures and things pulled out a video and said, look at this hydraulic uh, fluid here. And it looks like they cut the lines with a pressurize, that's what he said. And he shows me the video and there's this like, hydraulic fluid dispute everywhere, um, like on the ground, around it, it was a big mess. He said, do you really think Disney would do this? Like, think Disney would remove an animatronic this way? And I'm like, well, maybe, I've seen it happen before. So here's when things get really dicey. Because they accuse me of a lot of other things too, on top of stealing animatronic. Um, and I'm not going to talk about those things yet, because it's not time. And if things are still under investigation, I'm not going to get on YouTube and run my mouth about it. You know, it, that'd be dumb. Okay, so this entire video is dumb, namely because everything was still under investigation. So, that's why I had to wait so long to make this video. Because I think, actually today of filming this, it's been three months. Um, so continuing on, they got a search warrant for my house because this dude was so convinced I had Buzzy in my house. He was so convinced. They got a search warrant based on fake information, by the way. So obviously they didn't find Buzzy in my house because he never was there. Um, but the search warrant itself listed Disney animatronics and iPhones. The video shows a picture of the search warrant, and strangely enough, he edited out other information from the search warrant, including the clothing items that were shown in the picture, as well as his tan backpack. Well, they took three iPhones from me. No animatronics, but three iPhones. Why would they take three iPhones? Good question. I'll get back to that. But here's the real thing. So after they searched my house, um, I had an attorney, you know, so I said, what's up with this? Well, the attorney called this Orange County, and Orange County's like, well, it's not, it's, it doesn't matter anymore, you know, Patrick's no longer a, uh, a suspect for the animatronic theft. He's off the table, don't worry about it. You know, we're not, he's not being investigated for this anymore. So, that's really odd. Because they showed up, harassed me for a month, and they also questioned other people about me. They were questioning other people I used to work with and things about uh, me stealing the animatronic. And uh, it's been, it's been very clear I'd been in there because I had taken pictures of Buzzy. You know, I posted it on Twitter, you know, I, I mean, it, I'm not going to deny the fact I was inside of Cranium Command and I was the last one in there pretty much taking pictures of him before it was removed. Um, so why all of a sudden did they search my house, didn't find it, and all of a sudden I'm not a suspect anymore? You know, I couldn't have hit him in my friend's house or, you know, in, in a box buried somewhere. This is one of the most stupid things anyone we have covered has stated in their own defense. When you're publicly trying to exonerate yourself from false accusations, do not go on camera and explain different ways you could go about doing the same crime that you're being suspected of. It's unlikely any officer working on this case would state that he was no longer a suspect, especially if he was a suspect at the time and they were working on bringing the case against him. 
But even still, to go online, sit on a small couch in a stupid gray beanie, and explain that you could have totally done the crime, and here's all the ways you could have done it, is incredibly stupid. It's unlikely that he spoke to an attorney at all, as they would have told him not to make this video, not to go back to the scene of the crime, and not to speak about this publicly at all. But Patrick believes that he's a genius, and of course an anime villain, playing 4D underwater hungry hungry hippos with the police and Disney. It seemed, it seemed a little weird. So, you know, my Twitter's down for a month after all this happened, and there's the whole hashtag find Buzzy on Twitter, which you got tons of people uh, using it. Um, and I think it was like seven or eight weeks later, something like that, there was a big announcement from Disney about the Wonders of Life Pavilion, which is where the show was. And the pavilion had been seasonal, uh, and they were using it for some like, you know, like festival stuff. Well, there's a big announcement for it, and it turns out they're going to gut the entire thing and put new stuff in there. And it appears to be even the area that Buzzy was in. So it was a pure coincidence that a month, you know, a month, month or two before, uh, you know, it gets gutted, the thing gets removed. Is that this coincidence? It doesn't really seem like it. Um, there's a theory that someone had talked about that Imagineering removed Buzzy and didn't tell anyone else. So. When operations, the part of the company that runs like the pavilion, noticed he was missing, they found him as stolen. This theory was first made by Patrick to exonerate himself online. Disney is a massive corporation, but not so massive that this could occur. Moreover, Buzzy had been red tagged prior to the theft, meaning he was set to be professionally removed from the park by the Disney archive, likely in preparation for this refurbishment. The theft was seemingly in response to the red tagging, with the person wanting to take the animatronic before Disney could. So that sent everyone into a panic, filing a police report, and sending Orange County after, you know, after a suspect for it. When in the end, he was never taken by anybody except for Disney themselves. Now this is true, uh, it seems like a giant waste of taxpayer money. Because what, there was like eight or nine cops at my house for three, like three hours, just digging through everything. I mean, they searched every drawer, you know, whatever. I mean, they unwrapped my freaking Christmas presents for God's sake. Why? Like, is an animatronic gonna be in a shoebox? Well, apparently it could fit, according to them. And also, Orange County admitted to me that they had been questioning people for weeks, like working on this case for weeks. And they had even been out to Korean Command to take pictures of the, <laughs> of the crime scene which they actually shed showed me. So how much time did this had gone into this whole entire thing? Um, so did Disney like willingly you know, like file the report knowing that the thing wasn't stolen just to run me down? No. Again, Patrick has a massive ego. He cannot say what happened to him was justified in any way, shape, or form. It has to be an act of malice done by a corporation against his relatively small Twitter account because he is an incredibly important, powerful person. Even if he is innocent, he was the last person to illegally trespass and go into the Cranium Command, as well as taking video of the closed pavilion and posting them online. It makes sense that he would be a suspect and would need to be looked into. That doesn't even mention the fact that he had been incredibly antagonistic towards Disney in the weeks leading up to the theft, stating he was going to do giveaways of the things he stole from the Disney parks. Even if he didn't steal Buzzy, the police spending hours looking into him, talking to his co-workers, and verifying his alibi isn't Disney running him down and trying to destroy his account. It's them making sure a person who has a history of trespassing doesn't escalate his crimes. You know, because I obviously have been posting a lot of backstage photos and stuff and like, information, so, it just didn't make sense to me. Um, and they got my phones, but why? Um, like, I've thought, about, I've thought a lot about it, but it almost seems like they wanted my phones because they knew I had a bunch of backstage photos on them. And, like, if my phones got confiscated, you know, like, all of a sudden, I don't have any more photos. No, again. They took his phone because he had sent direct evidence of the theft of Buzzy's clothes to a co-worker and the police were able to find more evidence on the phone, showing he had stolen more items from the parks, not to mention proof on his PayPal account that he had sold the items for upwards of $29,000. It has nothing to do with Disney not wanting you to post photos, and more to do with the fact there is evidence of a crime. Well, that's not, that's not true, it's that I'm all backed up, you know, thank God. 
Um, but I still haven't gotten my phones back, and even though everything's been dropped, none of my stuff's been returned. So it seems really odd. It seems like a really big shakedown to scare me and get me to stop posting stuff. Which obviously didn't work because, you know, we came back strong. Like the day my Twitter came back online, I had like a thousand new followers in like a few hours. You know, so you know, it turned out to be a giant PR scare for them. And they were actually telling me too. They were like, oh yeah, don't, don't investigation, don't tell anybody. Well, if you're gonna search my house for it, of course I'm gonna tell everybody. So after that, you know, it was, I made it public to everyone. And I'm like, by the way, this thing was claimed to be stolen. Um, but now it looks like it's not. So, it was a giant waste of tax money. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but it just seems like this giant company used the police force to run someone down that they didn't like. There's also another rumor that he's gonna show up in the Guardians of the Galaxy Q line in some way. Um, and I don't really know. I really have no idea about that. His expression changes when he brings up Buzzy being in the queue, and it's likely because he knows that can't happen, because the animatronic was sincerely stolen. Um, but we're going to see, I guess. I mean, if it is, it's going to look even more stupid on them. But what's really interesting is uh, people were claiming, oh, well, if Buzzy was stolen, we would have seen a public report about it. Well, a company does not have to release the public report. They can request it be, like, withheld, you know, because a company having a giant animatronic stolen that uh, the report said, I looked at the report, it was on paper, the guy had it, on paper. Uh, estimated weight, 300 pounds, uh, value $120,000. Uh, it had like filled out like who filed it like at Disney, some, some women. Um, so it was official, but all of a sudden it's gone because I think they realized that it wasn't stolen. So obviously I don't wanna go back to Disney right now because I'm kind of mad, we got some beef going on. Um, but the backstage content doesn't stop because there's tons of people like who work there like sending it to me. I mean, there's what like seventy thousand something employees, you know, one year round. I mean, and there's even more guests who come in. I mean, out of all the guests that come in the parks, I mean, there's people who wander around backstage and never get caught. So, you know, feel free to stick around. Thanks for watching. The lead detective was made aware of the video and took note of the fact that Patrick had altered the search warrant. Two months later, on May 12, 2019, Spikes would tweet out this photo from the backdoor Disney account, showing Buzzy's head with its eyes, hair, and other parts removed. The photo was captioned, Buzzy's head, and it seemed like confirmation that he had in fact stolen the animatronic. Other park enthusiasts weighed in on the post, stating that this was likely a mold and not the genuine head from the animatronic, but no one could be sure. Five days later, he was arrested by Orange County Sheriff's Office after investigators connected Spikes to the Haunted Mansion costumes he had stolen almost a year prior. Though he was only charged with the theft of the Haunted Mansion costumes, court records also showed that he had stolen clothing from the Buzzy animatronic and sold them to Robin Lopez. Robin willingly gave up the items and showed proof that Spikes had been the one to sell them to him. Spikes maintained his innocence for a long while, even going so far as to post that the charges were false and that Disney was framing him. At one point, he posted a photo of a large shipping container claiming that Buzzy was inside the box and it was in storage with Disney Imagineering. The police followed up on this lead and found no evidence of this being true. On February 4th, 2020, Spikes and Taunton accepted plea deals, avoiding jail time. Spikes received 10 years probation and 250 hours of community service, while Taunton received five years probation and 125 hours of community service. After they were charged, Spikes was filmed walking out of the courthouse and stated, to celebrate not getting jail time, he would be going to Disney World, despite being banned from the property. Uh, they sure could have. Uh, Patrick Spikes was facing five felonies. His cousin was facing three. But now, after the plea this morning taken here at court in downtown Orlando, uh, they're facing years of probation and paying back restitution. The photos they took of each other and the items they stole from Disney World's Magic Kingdom and Epcot 
proved to be their undoing. Investigators say former employee Patrick Spikes and his cousin Blayton Taunton were in the business of swiping haunted mansion costumes, wigs, and other memorabilia and peddling them to collectors. One unwitting buyer was NBA player Robin Lopez, an avid Disney collector who purchased clothing belonging to the animatronic figure Buzzy from the former Cranium Command attraction. The figure itself, valued at $400,000, is still missing. Um, you understand that by entering this plea today that you're giving up these rights. Mr. Totten? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Spice? Yes, ma'am. Passing on the chance they might be acquitted at trial on the felony charges against them, Spikes and Taunton entered no contest pleas. For Spikes, dealing in stolen property, which landed him 10 years probation. For Taunton, grand theft and five years probation. Both will serve community service and share repayment of more than $25,000 in restitution. More than $6,700 to Disney, $10,700 to the NBA player Lopez, and more than $7,900 to Winter Park accountant Brett Finley. The prosecutor summed it up for the judge. Uh, the defendant did knowingly sell property. Uh, the reason belonged to Walt Disney, knowing that property was stolen, uh, consisted of costumes, clothing, or wigs, or any combination thereof. Can you tell us uh, what happened to the uh, other merchandise that hasn't been recovered yet? Smiling but saying nothing, Spikes and Taunton headed for the elevator. Despite what the judge told them just minutes earlier, you will not return to any Disney property while you're on probation. Spikes had this to say as he left the courthouse. Anything you want to say? I'm going to Disney World. However, this is not where the story ends. When researching the case, I spoke to the Theme Park Tribune, who had done the most concise, thorough reporting on what occurred here. In speaking to him, he told me that in 2020, he received a tip about spikes, which led him to another police report. The following is an excerpt from the report, which will be linked below. On November 15th, 2020, police were called to a Piggly Wiggly in Bay County in reference to a theft. While operating the store, the manager entered the manager's office to drop off paperwork and notified the money safe was open. Along with the safe being open, he observed multiple money tills laying on the ground and inside the safe, all of which were empty. There were no signs of forced entry to the building. I learned that Redacted, Redacted and Patrick Spikes were the last three employees at the store the night before and were the employees who locked up the building. Due to Patrick Spikes being related to the store owners, I began interviewing him. Patrick agreed to speak with me in my vehicle. Patrick confirmed having access to the alarm codes and safe codes. He also confirmed he had recently obtained the safe codes within the last three to six months. Patrick confirmed that he, redacted and redacted, exited the store last night around 9.10 p.m. He advised redacted being manager, locked up the back door, and set the alarm. Mr. Spikes mentioned that he changed the safe codes approximately six months ago, after receiving a tip from the Bay County Sheriff's Office that the store was going to be robbed by an inside job. This is not part of the police report, but the fact that Buzzy's theft was reported to police by an anonymous source, and they too claimed it was going to be an inside job, and the same thing happened here, is incredibly telling. I asked Patrick where he went upon leaving the store, and he informed me that he went straight home. Patrick stated he has cameras at his house, which could confirm his alibi. I inquired about Patrick's location services on his phone, and Patrick confirmed that he had turned them on. I informed Patrick that I could easily verify his story by looking at his phone locations for the past day, which would help me in the investigation by being able to quickly move on to other interviews. Patrick refused to allow me to look at his phone. His demeanor quickly changed and he became hostile and acting as if I had accused him of something. Patrick stated he had a bad prior experience with law enforcement and that he was on probation for dealing in stolen property after being accused of stealing from his prior employer, Disney World. I tried to explain to Patrick that I did not believe him to be a suspect and that I only needed to exonerate him so I could so I could help return the money stolen from his family. He informed the interview was over and quickly exited the vehicle. Based on Patrick's statements about his phone locations being on, his odd behavior while being questioned, and past criminal history, I detained Patrick, fearing he may attempt to destroy any potential evidence on his phone. I explained to Patrick that he was not under arrest and that he was only detained. 
I took possession of his cell phone and handed it to Mr. Spikes while securing Patrick. Both Mr. and Mrs. Spikes appeared upset that Patrick was detained. However, I explained the reasoning to them. I also explained the necessity to exonerate Patrick and that I believed there was crucial evidence on his phone. Mrs. Spikes requested to speak with Patrick privately and stated she would see if he would allow her to look at his phone. A short time later, Mrs. Spikes stated Patrick would allow me to look at one location on his phone. The phone location showed Patrick leaving in the fountain area at 9.16 p.m. I requested to look at additional locations. However, this request was refused. Mrs. Spikes then informed me that Patrick told her that he did not go straight home and that he had actually gone to the hospital but was embarrassed to tell me. Mrs. Spikes stated, Patrick has severe redacted and redacted due to his encounter with law enforcement in Orlando. Patrick operated the camera system and several minutes of video were watched until the timestamp on the live feed was checked. Upon checking the timestamp, it was learned the camera system was eventually 50 minutes fast. I asked Patrick if it was okay if I looked at the system myself. Patrick agreed but became increasingly anxious. Mrs. Spikes requested to take Patrick home. At this point, I asked Mr. Spikes if he would be interested in pursuing criminal charges against Patrick should the evidence show he committed the crime. Mr. Spikes advised he would not. I called Mr. Spikes and requested to meet with him. While speaking with Mr. Spikes on the phone, he informed that Patrick told him that Redacted and Redacted hung out in the parking lot after he left. Based on the footage previously obtained, this appears to be a lie. Patrick has now stated multiple inconsistencies about the night of the incident. He initially told me that he left the store and went straight home. Then it was stated he went to the hospital. Patrick then told Mr. Spikes that Redacted and Redacted were hanging out around the back of the store after he left, which is untrue. These inconsistencies, my prior interactions with him, and his prior criminal history led me to believe he is likely involved in this crime. I explained the investigative techniques available to prove or disprove Patrick's whereabouts, Burla download, cell phone download, etc. I explained all of this to Mrs. Spikes as well. Mr. and Mrs. Spikes advised they would go to Patrick's house tonight, speak with him, and search for the missing money. However, they were clear that they did not want me there and would not pursue prosecution should Patrick have committed the crime. The following day, 11-16-2020, I spoke with Mr. Spikes who stated he did not locate the missing money at Patrick's house and he did not think Patrick committed the offense. Mr. Spikes also informed me he did not want me to speak with Patrick any further. Using Patrick's phone number, I wrote a search warrant to obtain historical phone pings from Patrick's phone. Patrick's data shows consistent usage multiple times per hour until 8.55 p.m. when he calls his mother. This data shows Patrick's phone pinging off of a tower near the Piggly Wiggly. None of the call data shows Patrick near any of the area hospitals, as previously stated to his mother. This is another inconsistency in Patrick's statements. Additionally, Patrick was clearly on Highway 231, north of Highway 2301, at 10.34 p.m. Based on the above information, this case is being exceptionally cleared. Victim refused to cooperate. In the initial stages of the investigation, Patrick Spikes was identified as the primary suspect of the crime, perpetrator of the crime, had intimate knowledge of the store, safe codes, alarm codes, and location of the DVRs. All employees with this information were vetted and cooperative. Patrick displayed signs of deception, was uncooperative, and caught in several lies regarding his whereabouts the night of the crime. Additionally, Patrick has a history of stealing from his employers and is currently on probation for dealing in stolen property. I obtained the case file from the Orange County Sheriff's Office and upon reviewing it, learned that one of the witnesses described Patrick as someone who just likes to steal things. This above information was relayed to Mr. Spikes, who has refused to allow Patrick to be interviewed or investigated. At the time of this writing, Patrick still remains the main suspect. However, at the demand of the victim, he cannot be investigated. There are no further investigative leads at this time. As such, this case is exceptionally cleared. As of today, it appears as though Patrick runs his own Backdoor Disney Archive account on Twitter and is still relatively active. But that seems to be it. His parents refuse to press charges against him, despite the plethora of evidence that he stole $100,000 from their store. And given his propensity for stealing, this will likely not be the last time we hear about Patrick. Again, a huge thank you to Theme Park Tribune who made this video possible. All my sources will be linked below. As always, if there is a case you would like us to look into, let me know by emailing me at dreading.official at gmail.com or leaving me a comment down below. I hope you have a wonderful day and remember to stay safe.